with this uh, lecture, we finish the course. Uh, and uh, surely it has been a good experience uh, because of all the discussion we've had on the various aspects of Islam. Islam is uh, not easy to understand and certainly not a snap. In other words, we need to to love Muslims enough to, you know, in other words, respect them and to understand all we possibly can about Islam, including uh, and perhaps even giving emphasis to the to the to the, uh, the focus on uh, on folk practices or popular Islam. So we'll be we'll uh, end with this. And uh, this includes some discussion about jinn, the powerful spirits. Remember that power is the key word here. Power this, power that, power places. And here you have powerful uh, spirits. The Quran is not silent about this. I remember I was some years ago when I was in California, I did uh, a little, was uh, some students came from a Bible school and uh, they visited a mosque and uh, I was there to help answer some questions and I gave a talk on why I was a Christian and the Muslim Imam who's quite famous actually in that part of of the world uh, from Egypt gave a talk on why he was uh, a Muslim but anyway one of the students said to him what about jinn what about spirits and the guy I don't know what happened to him uh, either he was faking it or uh, he had a lapse of memory but he just stood there and said Nothing. I, I know nothing about it. The truth is that uh, either he was denying it or uh, I'm not exactly sure what, but uh, there's jinn all over the Quran. Look at 6100. It says, yet they make the jinns equal with Allah, though Allah did create the jinns. And they falsely have no knowledge attributed to him, sons and daughters, and so on, so on. Uh, so th that's just an example. 18 verse 50 is another one. I think I mentioned before that uh, there are many, many references to jinn in the Quran, including a, a chapter called Al Jinn, 72. Uh, here it said, Behold, we said to the angels, Bow down to Adam. They bowed down, except Iblis. He was one of the, what? Jinns. And he broke the command of his Lord. Will you then take him against him and his progeny as protectors? Um, so, there it is, and I guess we could uh, have one more verse up there too. I might as well uh, look at that too, 55 and uh, verses 14, 55, 14 through 15. He created jinn from fire free of smoke. Uh, then which of the favors are, of your Lord will you deny? So. Certainly, uh, jinn is in there. In fact, I would say that the whole context, the whole context of the Quran is uh, in this spiritual world, uh, spirits and blessings and curses. Uh, apparently, in pre-Islam, they called the jinn by whistling, and so Muslims may not look kindly on uh, on us when we whistle. Uh, I myself like to whistle, but I had to be careful of this. In the uh, in Pakistan because uh, of, of the connotations, I wasn't aware of it in the beginning. Uh, Bismillah, as I mentioned before, when a, a man has sexual intercourse with his wife, he's supposed to say Bismillah, in the name of God, so that the offspring will not be a devil. And when the baby is born, the first seven days are crucial because uh, the very very vulnerable to spirit particularly the Karina, and so there is a great need to protect the newborn from the jinn. Uh, unmarried girls are susceptible to, to the jinn. In other words, uh, they, they, they uh, sometimes, uh, in other words, because you, you want to marry them off, you want to protect them and all of that kind of stuff, yawning, sneezing, and one thing or another, you can be um, can be harmed, the jinn can get inside of you and you have to say bismillah when somebody yawns. Uh, during the festivals, as we've already talked about, the men to the mosque, Eid al-Fitr, uh, which is the, 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 the end of Ramadan, 
men to the mosque and the women to cemetery with fruit and they carry candies and flowers and so on. Later the men themselves come. This is not really what you'd call uh, acceptable. In other words, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's very popular stuff. Either Ladha, the same thing, visit to the cemeteries. Idul Maudul uh, Nabi is growing in its veneration, even though it's not legitimate. Uh, the Saudis are against it, but it goes on. Uh, the world is full of baraka. And so you do everything you possibly can to soak up this loose translation as blessing, but it's really more than that. It's political pull, it's power, the whole thing. And uh, the Quran is full of it. The graves of saints are imbued with baraka, a little... Uh, little children are are uh, you know they're they're full of it too, a lot of it. A new married newly married couple. By the way, in much of the Muslim world, uh, the bride wears red, and they do in India as well. Uh, but 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 the newly married couple is full of baraka. Some animals like the horse, like the sheep, like the dove, and some plants. Uh, you can, uh, you know, give, give blessing just by having a cup of tea uh, or giving greetings. You know, that's, uh, that's important. So you do that too. Magic is forbidden in the Quran, but it is recognized as a force. And uh, in 5103, I think there is something here that is relevant. It was not Allah who instituted superstitions like those of a slit ear, you see, the camel, the slit ear of a camel, she camel. Why do they slit it? For good luck. Let loose for free pasture, eyeless hyperbase, or twin birds and animals. So in other words, if an animal has twins, there's a danger of, 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 of some kind of a curse or one thing or another. So, uh, in some cases, magic is used to ward off evil, even though it's wrong. Nevertheless, the power is admitted. And so there are various things that are used. For instance, the hand of Fatima is seen all over the Muslim world. And this has an eye in the center, in the palm. And it's often hung or painted on taxis and cars in the Muslim world. It's the hand of Fatima to protect you from the evil eye. So when you get there, in other words, keep your eye open for this hand of Fatima. Uh, you are afraid of naming certain diseases, lest uh, there be bad luck in it. In other words, you, we, can, you know, we don't like to use the word cancer either. But uh, you don't say certain things in Islam, in Muslim contexts, because of the bad luck that is uh, the connotation of it. For instance, uh, you don't mention death, uh, never, lest it, it actually come. Uh, two guys can be fishing. The one is successful and the other is not. And the one who's not would accuse the other one of putting the evil eye on it so that he's not catching any fish. God's name is used as a protection against the evil eye. All right, let's end with some missiological implications. We've uh, finished this course. We've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about uh, a lot of formal stuff and we're ending up with informal stuff. I think is really uh, the most important in the sense that this is where the heart of Muslims are. This is where the power is. This is where the where the uh, really the felt needs are. Especially when we preach the gospel, when we minister, we have to keep these things in mind. If we don't, we're we're going to miss it. Uh, what are the missiological implications? Well, several things. Uh, you know, wearing crosses. We we think it's okay, we hear, see people in this country wearing crosses and so on, but it's not really a good idea in the Muslim world, and I think uh, apart from the fact that the cross is, is, a, is an offense to Muslims, which is another subject, 
but Muslims would look at it as a wearing it as sort of an amulet. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's my own view. Now we need to teach about the the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit meets our needs. Don't we need Him ourselves? And haven't we often neglected Him? In other words, we our doctrine is often wanting in the churches. Uh, our understanding of the Trinity, our appreciation of the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, of His power in our lives, is often minimized. It's not understood. And it is negated how we need to talk about the power of the Spirit. Remember that Jesus said uh, that, that, uh, that when I go away, I will send him. And he will remind uh, you of me. He will bring things to your, to your remembrance. Uh, but, but, but the big thing is uh, that I'm thinking of here is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It has to do with, with power. Uh, how we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 8. You will receive power from the Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. Oh God, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we minister and work with Muslims. But we need it in our in our own lives, and we need to minister through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, then the book of Acts, it's, a book of, it's really the book of power. They, they worked through the Spirit. It was, it's really the, the acts of the Spirit, really, more than anything. And we need to emphasize Jesus as mediator and intercessor. Remember the Hadith where Muhammad said, look at my, um, I can't promise, you know, intercession for, for my uncle, for my, uh, for my daughter, for my sister, for anybody, really. That, that's, that's not my power at all. But we know that Jesus is our intercessor. And we can pray to him, so let's pray to him. In the presence of Muslims, and away from them, let's pray for them. God help us to be faithful intercessors. He is the mediator. He is the mediator between God and men. There is no other name whereby you must be saved. It's the name of Christ Jesus. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, there is so much that is relevant uh, for Muslims uh, because of, uh, of just the themes. In, in, Rome, in uh, Hebrews chapter 17 and verse 16, it talks about... Um, uh, he who became a priest on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. My goodness sakes, uh, they want power, and here it is. Why wouldn't they come to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of the faith, who has more power than any, uh, uh, anyone else? Power over death, what they're so afraid of. The sun, 1 and verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his what? Powerful word. Uh, they, they need to understand this, this power. 7 and, uh, and 25, such a high priest meets our needs. Well, we'll actually back up a little bit. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And then 726, such a power, a priest, high priest meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, unlike other priests. And then it goes on to say that his sacrifice is once for all when he offered himself. And the verses uh, are, are, are on to 10 and 22. It talks about, uh, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith. Uh, cleanse, our, cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Let us concern how we may help one another, spur one another on to love and good deeds. You see, we have the perfect peer, if, if you could call him that. Uh, he is perfect and holy and 
and uh, 5 and verse 9. It says he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he pig in the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So there is much in the book of Hebrews that applies. It's, it's uh, excellent theology, excellent instruction, excellent doctrine for people who come out of Islam. There is this exousia, this power in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, anything can happen. We don't manipulate him. We don't use his name for our own benefit and power and, and, and advantage. We don't use the gospel for those that purpose, but we do believe in the powerful name of Jesus to heal the sick and to, and to minister the gospel. Um, that's what we believe in. And to, uh, to deal, deal with fear. Don't we? Uh, Satan is our enemy, and he's the enemy of, of, uh, of Muslims. He wants to keep them enslaved, to keep them in fear. And oftentimes people sell out their soul to Satan because of their loneliness. You know, when you look at the Zara cult in the Sudan or the Egypt or wherever it is, people are looking for some kind of, uh, they're looking to be ministered to. Well, they do it here too, but uh, Muslims are very much into this. So we need to, to, uh, to draw near to God. Uh, medical missions is uh, a ministry whereby people's felt needs are ministered to. And there are many, there are many needs. Physical needs are are so prevalent in the Muslim world. If you were to go to a place like northern Pakistan uh, or Afghanistan, some of our former students are in that part of the world ministering. Uh, they're not all medical people, but some of them, uh, they minister to people in medical ways and, and psychological ways as well. Medical missions deals with, with the whole person they really need Christ, and uh, we minister Christ, and oftentimes that includes uh, medical missions as well. So praise God that we can help them in any way, and we can pray for them. May God use this course, uh, the things we've talked about, for the furtherance of the gospel, for the glory of his name. In Jesus' name, amen.